Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, I'm running a bit late today. Hang on a minute. Uh, I felt a drop of water suddenly. Ah, yes, welcome along uh, to another Listen with Vobes. Um, just uh, dashing about as ever. So, here we go. Sorry about that. Slightly, uh, slightly uh, mad here. Uh, welcome along to the uh, Listen with Vobes. I'm Richard Vobes, and uh, we're reading London Belongs to Me. You, you know all that. Um, I gather people haven't been reading. <laughs> Julius just got in touch and said, uh, I haven't had a chance to look at the comments and look at the, uh, um, the, how the today's video is going down, other than, I think, this morning, a couple of things. But uh, a number of people... Uh, Justine Jones has just said uh, a number of people are giving me congratulations for getting engaged. Uh, they clearly haven't watched the video. How embarrassing for them. Uh, <laughs> retelling my life story, such as it is so far. And um, that's fascinating that people are putting comments, haven't watched the video at all. They're just interested in putting comments. That's fascinating. I find that uh, incredible. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Uh, let's, uh, Billabong O'Neill says, um, most enjoyable, no, wait a minute, where are you? Uh, most enjoyable video and podcast this morning. Thank you very much. I'm glad that people are actually, uh, listening or watching any of the nonsense I shove out. So hello to the lovely Julia, to Turbo Stream, to Tool Podge Rog. Uh, to Bing Bing Billabong O'Neill, Justine Jones. I see to be BT's video has prompted some congratulation messages on Facebook. <laughs> that is very funny. I haven't looked at Facebook. I wonder how many of those would delete themselves. D keep, an, keep an eye on it. Somebody screen grab the page and then we'll compare it later and see if they've gone, oh, delete. <laughs> who, hasn't, who hasn't watched the video? Um... Dudley Sawyer, hello to you. Billabong O'Neill just said that. Uh, Zom Coco, David Vad, Lee Lawson, Audrey Forbes, Jen Coley and uh, Philip Hammond and Mary. Uh, all good stuff, Lee Lawson. Now there's eight, now there's April, there's, sorry, but there's, now that's April's. I've obviously missed it. And that, Sensible Paul, hello to you. Good afternoon. Think Julia should keep an eye on Joe. As Richard says, children bounce. <laughs> Oops. Uh, anyway, um, nice to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Hello to anybody else who comes along um, later. Let me just have a quick slurp of tea. I've uh, been running around a bit today. I've been down in Earnley for another Sussex border walk for tomorrow. I've just finished the edit, but I have yet to encode it and upload it. Um, and I've sort of half watched it through, so I've got to go and do that. It takes it takes forever, all of this, and then there's the show. Uh, right, we are on chapter seventy-seven, ladies and gentlemen. I, uh, can you hear me? I probably look sound a bit um, low. I look like my microphone was a bit low there. Sorry about that. Okay, I think we're we're running, and I've calmed myself down a bit. Um, this is chapter seventy-seven. Doris needn't have worried about Cynthia. She was all right. When they didn't turn up, she guessed that, oh, this is right, because um, she stayed the night, didn't she, with Bill, and he'd come back. Only is my village, says Tool Podge Rog. Oh, well, I'm sorry, mate. I didn't say very th any nice things about it. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I, 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 didn't, I didn't say anything nasty about it at all. Sorry. Um, but I didn't see much of it, to be fair. Um, and actually, you probably can answer the, some of the questions I've launched in the in the video. So tomorrow you better tell me about that. Um, but anyway, I don't want to spoil it. So, yes, so Cynthia had spent the night with Bill because he'd got back. So there we go. Um, oh, they live right by the church. Well, their house may well be featured in it then. How nice. Is that the, uh, is, is your parent, are one of your parents, little old lady with a stick saying, Oi, get that smelly van out of my garden. There was nowhere to park, so I had to park in her garden. I may have made that up. Doris needn't have worried about Cynthia. She was all right. 
but when they didn't turn up, she guessed that they had planned to spend the night together somewhere in town because it would be so romantic that way. She dropped off to sleep thinking about them and in the morning there was a letter from Ted. It was a lovely letter, everything a letter from an absent husband could be. My own darling Cynthia, it ran, I love you more than ever. All night I think about you. You are my only girl. Don't be angry if I tell you that I've got Veronica Lake's picture over my head. It's only because she's got hair and shoulders like you. Honest it is, Cynthia. Sometimes I think I can't bear it any more, not having you with me. After the war, I want you to have a tight black costume with a white blouse. And I've seen some late lace night night dresses like I've always meant to give you but couldn't get in London. Have you still got the red shoes with the open tops? Don't wear them out before I come home. And don't have any of your hair off, not even if it's ever so long. I want to see it now, right over your shoulders, when I get back to Blighty. And now, darling, don't be angry with me if I say something. Some of the chaps out here can't trust their wives once they're away from home. There are two cases in our camp. If ever I heard that there had been anyone hanging around you, I know what I would do about it. I would kill him. I mean it. If I found out that you had somebody else come into your life while I wasn't there, I'd have bought you a pair of French slippers with real swan down on them. They're pink and they look pretty they look pretty under your pink dressing gown. As they're fives, they ought to be all right but I expect they'll get pinched like everything else. The post is awful. One man had a letter saying his father had died and it took seven weeks to reach him. Two of your letters arrived at once, so you can guess how I'd been worrying. Take care of yourself and don't stop, to, and don't stop up too late reading. All my love, sweetest, Ted. P.S. Kiss baby for me. And tell her I'm going to buy her a present as soon as I can find anything decent. Keep cheerful. And don't forget what I said. I'll kill him. I'll kill him. If he's, anyone hangs around with you, I'll kill him. I guess it must have been quite worrying for blokes, all the blokes going. But then all the eligible blokes have probably gone off to the army, haven't they? Ted could do with a dose of bromide. Yes, he probably could. Because it was such a beautiful letter, she wanted to read it again. And she didn't want to read, reread it out there in the kitchen with the washing up all round her. So she went through to the drawing room. She'd been in there yet. She hadn't been in there yet this morning. But she didn't have trouble with... But Oh, golly, I'm sorry, I'm reading rubbish now. But she, did have, she didn't have to draw the blinds. She just put on the light and sat down on the couch beside the crumpled evening paper that was left over from last night. Then she started on the letter for a second time. She didn't mind a bit about Veronica Lake if that was only why Ted had her picture up. She wanted the black costume too. It was something that she'd always wanted. Only somehow or other she always wanted a bright one when the time came. And the bit about her hair, Ted had always loved her hair. She used to tease him sometimes by saying that she was going to have it shingled. When she came to the bit about what Ted would do if anyone else came into their lives, she cried. Cried like anything. But she enjoyed crying over this sort of thing. It was thrilling having a husband who was jealous as all that. It made life worth living, even when he wasn't there. But it was silly, too. What chance had she got to give him anything to be jealous about, even if she wanted to? She'd only ever been out with one man since Ted had been away. And that had been to the co-op. She'd only been out with one man since Ted had been away. And that had been to the co-op dance with someone from Ted's department. Oh, I see. What was more, Ted had asked him to take her. There had been three of them because he had to take his own wife too. She wished now that Ted hadn't said what he'd said about being faithful. It made her feel cheap. What right had he 
to tell her how to behave. If he didn't trust her, he shouldn't have married her. Come to that, how did she know that Ted had been faithful to her? She did know, of course, because Ted was the sort of who would be faithful. Always and forever. Because he was built that way. But it just showed that he shouldn't have written such things, because then she wouldn't have thoughts of that kind about him. She remembered the bit about the red shoes, but it wasn't really as simple as that. It was just like a man to think that it was. Even if she wore them when Ted came back, she wouldn't be the same. Her hands were getting awful with all the work that she had to do, and looking after Baby, even though she was such a darling, was beginning to tell on her. If Ted wanted to find her as she had been when he went away, the best thing was that he could do would be to get herself a job as soon as possible and see... Sorry. If Ted wanted to find her as she had been when he went away, the best thing that she could do would be to get herself a job as soon as possible so that she could see someone sometimes. It was Baby that was the difficulty, of course. But she knew other girls with babies who managed somehow. There were creches, weren't there? She'd seen pictures of them in the papers. Hundreds of happy babies all playing under artificial sun lamps while their mothers made munitions and had lunchtime concerts and things. It wasn't, as a matter of fact, really munitions that appealed to her. She wanted to be an usherette again, and usherettes were wanted just as much as munition workers. They were advertising for them at the Granada and at the Astoria and the Ritz. She couldn't walk into a job anywhere. Oh, sorry, she could walk into a job anywhere. And then, when she'd been able to see some decent films while she was actually doing a war job, well, it wouldn't seem like being buried alive with baby. Only, what would Ted say? He didn't like the idea of her working. He'd rather she just sat at home, waiting. It was so unfair, this business of having to consider somebody else's feelings when it was her own life that was affected. So unfair that she started crying again. She cried for quite a long time and then she felt better. There wasn't any sense anyhow in just sitting there when she got things to do and it was gloomy with the electric light on and the daylight coming in through the chinks in the blackout curtains. So she got up and began putting the room straight. When she pulled back the curtains, she shook up the... When she'd pulled back the curtains, she shook up the cushions and pulled the covers into position. She wanted the room to look nice, as if Bill was coming. A whimper, half a cry, half a grumble from Baby sent her running. Baby was sitting in the high chair in the kitchen where she'd left her. She snatched her out of the chair and started cuddling her. Mummy won't ever send Baby to a creche, she said. Mummy loves Baby far too much for that. Silly Daddy made Mummy cry, but Mummy always got Baby to make her happy. All the same, it wasn't too much to ask, just to get out of the flat and see a decent film sometimes. Bill and Doris, Bill thoroughly carrying a new doll for baby, got back from Larkspur Road after lunch. Bill had wanted to spend the rest of the afternoon in West End seeing a show, but Doris wouldn't let him. She reminded him that after they had been to Cynthia's, they would still have to go round to the Jossers. Her mother, she said, would be waiting for them. It would look rude if they left it any longer. But again, Doris was wrong. Mr and Mrs Josser were entirely preoccupied. In their present mood, they wouldn't have noticed if Bill and Doris had stayed away together. I never thought Henry would be the one to go first. It still doesn't seem possible it's happened. It was Mrs Josser who had spoken, and Mr Josser, paper in hand, looked up from the paper he was reading. There had been no preliminary conversation leading up to Mrs Josser's remark. 
no bridge. It was simply one of those observations that occur suddenly, isolated and unannounced, as though a portion of the speaker's mind had become detached and is drifting away into space. Mr Josser considered the point. Pneumonia is a funny thing, he agreed at last. You can never tell with it. As he was speaking, he raised his eyes to the mantel shelf. All that now remained of Uncle Henry rested there. His ashes scattered, his business sold, even the name Knockle above the shop had been changed to Skite and Son. His library of alarming yellow literature dispersed. The one monument to the man was contained in the large full-scap envelope leaning up against the presentation clock. Not that it was an impressive sort of envelope. Mr Barks knew the etiquette in such manners and he'd used only the best stationery. Oh, sorry, not that it wasn't an impressive sort of envelope. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Getting at the letter inside was like ripping armour. It had come that morning, the letter, and Mr and Mrs Josser had both of them read it and re-read it. They had known all about it, of course, even been expecting it. Nevertheless, now that it had come, they were dazed. Distinctly dazed. And in consequence, they had nothing about it. And in consequence, they had done nothing about it. Mr Josser hadn't liked to suggest paying the cheque into his account because, after all, it was addressed to Mrs Josser. And it was such a thunderingly big cheque. It dominated everything. Despite all his socialist views, Uncle Henry must have been steadily piling it on in the greengrocery line for years. A halfpenny on the peas here, a penny on the Blenheims there, and it had all added up to something pretty terrific. The cheque that Mr Barks had sent to Mrs Josser was for more than a thousand pounds. One thousand one hundred and twenty-eight pounds six and fourpence, to be precise. We we ought to pay it in, you know, Mrs. J Mr. Joseph said finally. J just supposing there was an air raid, for instance, we shouldn't have anything to show for it once this house was hit. Mrs. Josser drew in her lips sharply. If that happened, we shouldn't be here either, she observed grimly. Then she paused. I haven't done anything about it because I don't like to touch it, she added. I can see it's silly, but I just don't like to touch it. I know how you feel, Mr. Josser told her. It seems a pity poor old Henry didn't get more fun out of the money himself. Henry had all the fun he wanted, Mrs Josser replied sharply. It was just, he was made that way. The subject of Uncle Henry was still a delicate one and Mr Josser didn't attempt any answer. Ever since his death, Mrs Josser had defended her brother's memory with fierceness and asperity. And in consequence, the character of Uncle Henry was perceptibly changing. In retrospect, he'd become a kind of nearly, a very nearly Christian saint with a flair for cycling. It was a lot of money he left, Mr Josser observed neutrally. Well, why not, Mrs Josser demanded. He worked hard for it, didn't he? She paused. And another, a new aspect of her brother's saintliness suggested itself to her. If he'd wanted to, she added, he could have had a whole chain of shops like that instead of just one of them. He could have been like the Waltons. Mr Josser got up and knocked the ash out of his pipe. Think I'll make a cup of tea, Mother, he said. I expect we're both like one. He was rather relieved that the incident of the tea provided an opportunity for changing the subject from Uncle Henry he had rather a lot of Uncle Henry all day, and it wasn't the Uncle Henry he recognised. He had a suspicion that Uncle Henry wouldn't have recognised himself either. 
When he got back with the tea, Mrs Josser was going round the room, tidying up. This was always a sign with her. Whereas other people went for a long, solitary walk or wrote letters to the papers or retired to bed with a headache, Mrs Josser did an extra round of tidying. It was a sure indication that there was something on her mind. We'll drink the tea now it's made, she said. Oh, we'll drink the tea now it's made, she said, as Mr Josser entered, and then we'll go straight off to the agents. We'll start looking tomorrow. Tomorrow's Sunday, Mr Josser reminded her. Well, there are just as many cottages on a Sunday as there are on any other day, aren't there? So that was it. Because of Mr Josser's Mrs Jotter's reticence. He hadn't liked to raise the subject of cottages himself. In the circumstances, it would have looked as if he was trying to spend her money for her. And it wasn't always possible... Uh, sorry, and it was always possible that she had changed her mind. For all he knew, she might have decided to give the money to one of the societies whom Uncle Henry, during his lifetime, had devoted his activities. Already he had seen half... Already he had, already he had half seen her as the pat patroness, patroness, of the North Hackley Anti God Committee. But there was no doubt about it, Mrs. Josser was decided. We'll go to the agents today, and then start looking on Monday, she announced. We won't skimp ourselves. We'll buy just the sort of cottage Henry would have liked us to have. And this was strange because the only time they discussed cottages with Uncle Henry, he had been opposed to them. They ought to be all condemned, he said, condemned, and blocks of agricultural workers' flats put up in their place. They were still talking about cottages when Bill and Doris arrived. It seemed to Doris callous and unfeeling to go on with such a topic when Bill was due to go overseas in 24 hours' time. But Bill seemed rather relieved about it, and he said something that brought Mrs Josser nearer to liking him than she had ever been before. What he said was that it was nice to think that if the air raids really got bad, Doris would have somewhere out of London to go. And now we're on book six, The Cottage in the Country. Air right, oh, on air sign has come back to life, has it? It's gone off again, hasn't it? I don't know. Chapter 78. As a matter of fact, Mr Josser was relieved too. He was only thinking of Mrs Josser. London wasn't the sort of place in which to leave any woman these days. Everything had been going so badly over on the other side. The remains of our army in Norway, the one that had gone out complete with skis and fur coats for warfare in the snow, had embarked at Namsos, leaving its skis and white coats behind it. And there were rumours admittedly only rumours so far, about Germans' intention in the West. Belgium was to be the next one, people said, not Holland, because the dykes would make fighting impossible. And whether it was true or not about Belgium, the Belgians themselves certainly believed it. Mr Josser had read in the paper that morning that all the traffic on the Albert Canal had been suspended. Altogether, it seemed a funny sort of morning on which to go out choosing a country cottage. It was either very frivolous or only just in time. It was getting on for ten o'clock when the Jossers finally emerged, and there was just a hint of peril hanging over the expedition. Mrs Josser kept on referring mysteriously to her feet, as though they had as though they were a pair of scarcely convalescent invalids who, for better or worse, had decided to accompany them. If they let her down, she emphasised, Mr Josser would have to go without her. 
It was unfortunate, therefore, that Mrs Josser should have decided that they should make Crouch End their destination. She had been there once as a girl, and she remembered it from the one afternoon, 48 years ago, with sentimental enthusiasm amounting to nostalgia. Don't want to go and bury ourselves miles from anywhere, she explained. There's lovely country all around Crouch End. We'll just go and have a look around. God almighty, 1948. Uh, well, 1940 this is, isn't it? Crouch End. I've just been reading about the um, the building up of London and all the infill and all the, the new housings that had gone up from the 1900s onwards and how the um, underground railways would come in into very rural parts of London then and then within the space of 20 years... Um, it just filled up with god-awful housing. And um, it's curious, actually, to see how they what they think about it as they get to it. May have changed a bit since you were there, Mother, Mr Josser warned her. But Mrs Josser would not hear anything against the place. Not Crouch End, she said confidently. You don't know Crouch End. Nor did she when she got there. They took one look at the shops and the row of houses and the buses and decided to go on until further... Sorry, decided to go on still further into the unknown. There was something rather terrifying in having come so far only to find themselves somewhere still in the heart of London. So Mr Josser suggested a cup of coffee at a Lyons before they went on. The Lyons was an exact replica of the one in Kennington, and this simple fact depressed them anew. It was as though they hadn't yet even left home. While they were sitting there, Mrs Josser kept muttering something about having told so until Mr... Mr Josser... Oh, sorry. I'm, I apologise if I'm reading rubbish today. While they were sitting there, Mr Josser kept mutting, muttering something about having told her until Mrs Josser asked him sharply what he was saying. But as Mrs Josser hadn't heard him properly, no real harm had been done. And a remark, which she made quite casually, changed the whole compl complexion of her blunder. It must have been longer ago than I thought, she said simply. I was 16 at the time. The effect on Mr Josser was remarkable. He put down his cup and, leaning forward, gave Mrs Josser's hand... A squeeze. That was before I met you, he said. I wish I'd known you then. Mrs Josser went on drinking. You've known me quite a long you've known me quite long enough, was all she said. It was easy, however, to see that she was pleased. She looked at him sideways and gave him a little smile, and Mr Josser forgave her for Crouch End. They set out again, still in search of the undeveloped hinterland that Mrs Josser remembered. They penetrated further and further into the endless desert of identical little red houses. Even the names of roads, Grove Road, Windermere Road, Alexander Road, Hillside, Elm Avenue, Victoria Terrace, Balmoral Gardens, they all seemed identical too. They were travelling on relays of buses by now, and when they reached Edmonton, it was time for lunch. It might have been better if they'd turned back from there, but Mrs Josser was in no mood for turning back. After the rebuff at Crouch End, she now saw the whole expedition in terms of a challenge. With Mr Josser following, she pressed on. By three o'clock they were at Waltham Abbey, and because... In between the houses, little patches of green started to appear. Their spirits rose. They went into every estate agent they could see and, ban and began collecting orders to view. There was a firm called Spracket and Clut, which seemed the most promising. Between them, Mr Spracket and Mr Clut seemed a to spread the net pretty wide. Waltham Abbey was really only the beginning of things. 
The properties caught up in their mesh were mostly in the countryside behind Waltham. There was one in particular, Conservatory Cottage, Ditchfield, that, in the, that the clerk recommended. It belonged to a, a Miss Marble, Mrs Marble, not Miss Marple, Mrs Marble, that had come on the market only that morning. He advised the Jossers to see it at once. He didn't conceal that it was a pity that they had come to Waltham first because a round, it was a roundabout way to Ditchfield. But he was friendly, almost fatherly sort of man. He explained that when they actually lived in Ditchfield, they would have a station of their own, only two miles away. As it was, the Jossers had to go by bus. It was a small, single-decker. And it didn't hurry. It rumbled. It waited for people. It stopped at crossroads to deliver things. And by the time they reached Ditchfield, they had been right across the steppes and tundras of Essex. And... Of Essex? Oh, OK. And it was now after five, and they wanted tea. But Ditchfield didn't seem to be the kind of village that provided teas. The hamlet, or as much of it as could be seen at a glance, stretched for nearly half a mile along a perfectly straight road. There was a public house, the plough, closed as only an English public house at tea time can be closed, a petrol pump without a garage, a post office in a converted villa with a large enamelled sign over the front door advertising Hovis. And on the gate, a poster of a sinking ship and a warning against careless talk. But it seemed a long way somehow from Ditchfield to the North Atlantic. After the post office, the houses petered out a bit. There was an elm tree with no branches, a small patch of grass worn threadbare like an old carpet, and a pond so low that it seemed to have a leak in it somewhere. In a field opposite rested the upper part of a small delivery van from which the engine and chassis were unaccountably missing. Altogether, Ditchfield was a representative corner of unspoiled rural England, the sort of place that tourists miss. The bus driver had never heard of Conservatory Cottage, and by the time Mr Josser had finished speaking to him, the other passengers had all disappeared. So they tried at the post office. The postmistress was of the compassionate kind. She seemed worried at the idea that anyone should want to walk as far as Conservatory Cottage. She agreed readily, however, that there was no other way of getting there and came out to the gate to show them the way. It was not difficult. As straight on down the road would get them there, she said, and uh, there's no turnings. It was the last house on the left, after the sand pit. For the first half mile, they chatted as they walked along. Then Mrs Josser grew silent. Grim and unsmiling, she proceeded. She was peering anxiously ahead for what looked like a sand pit. But Mr Josser was enjoying himself. He was walking like a man in a dream. For the better part of half a century, he had been awaiting precisely this moment when he and Emily should be passing down a country lane together, looking for a cottage. It was just such a day of heat and bright sunshine that he had always imagined, and now, magically, the moment had come. Shouldn't be long now, Mother, he said, encouragingly. But Mrs Josser still said nothing. But it was obvious that she was in a bad condition, a, a really bad condition. It wasn't a trifling thing like her feet, either. This was altogether more serious. The danger zone had shifted upwards. It was one of her headaches that Mrs Josser expected any moment to be getting. The way things were working out, Mrs Josser judged that she wasn't going to like Ditchfield. And then came one of those magical surprises, those sudden transformations of which even the flattest of English countrysides is capable. The road behind them 
was as straight as a ruler, but the ground on either side had began to drop away slightly, and through a gap in the hedges, a view appeared. It was like coming on an open door in a long corridor. As far as they could see across the heat haze of the late afternoon, the green and brown pattern of the countryside was spread out before them, and it looked good. Even the sandpit turned out to be beautiful. It was an old one. The notice board about truck loads to order, distance no object, was half covered up by branches, and the pit itself was simply a bowl of willow herb. Mr Josser would like to have stopped there for a bit and take a look at it, but Mrs Josser made it quite evident that if she paused so much for a single moment, she would never go on again. And then, behind the little copse, Conservatory Cottage appeared. It was white and clean-looking, and the hedge in front of it had been cut into a neat green battlement. A double border of flowers led up to a green front door. Mr Josser stood for a moment at the gate, appraising it all, but Mrs Josser urged him forward. Just as long as there's somewhere I can sit down, that's all I ask, she said. We don't know if there'll be anybody in, Mr Josser warned her. We didn't say we were coming. But Mrs Marble was there all right, a, a large, vague woman in a flowery overall. She was standing in the window watching them. She came to the front door wearing a pleased but rather puzzled expression as though she were afraid that she might have invited them and then forgotten all about it. Oh dear, she said, I, I wasn't expecting anybody so soon. If I'd known you were coming, I, I would have got things ready. Uh, but do come in. I i better get you some tea. After the heat and glare outside, it was cool and dim within the cottage. Mrs Josser loosened both her shoes and said, Ah, a pleasant smell of beeswax and old furniture filled the room and Mr Josser felt sleepy. There was no opportunity of any rest, however, as Mrs Marble kept asking them questions. She asked them twice how they had come, how far they had come, and was astonished each time to find that it was from London. She told them that the station was really only half a mile away, just if you went across the fields. She asked whether they ever lived in the country before. She asked how they had heard that the cottage was for sale. She asked if they liked lettuce, and, and then remembered that all hers had run to seed. She asked how far they had come, and was astonished to hear. The tea did Mrs Josser good. After drinking it, drinking it, a light perspiration broke out on her forehead, and after she had furtively and politely wiped it away with her handkerchief, she felt better. It was her turn now to begin asking Mrs Marble questions. Was the cottage dry? How long had Mrs Marble lived there? What was the water supply like? When did she propose to leave? Was an Elson easy if you were to choose... If what was an Elson easy if you weren't used to one? I don't know what an Elson is. It must be a thing. Uh, Mr Josser didn't say anything at all. He just sat back admiring his wife. She might have been buying cottages all her life. Mrs Marble was impressed too. She asked again if Mrs Josser had ever lived in the country before. While the two women went upstairs, privately and mysteriously on their own, Mr Josser sauntered out into the garden. It wasn't a large garden. There were bigger gardens in many of the suburbs. But after one look at it, Mr Josser decided he'd never seen a nicer one. There were two fruit trees, and a well, and a kitchen plot, and a bit of a lawn with a rustic seat at one end. When he came to the conservatory, he saw why the cottage had been named after it. The conservatory was very nearly as large as the cottage. 
It had been put up in the best style with a length of ornamental metalwork running along the top of it and there was a handle for winding up the windows at the sides. It was quite the most beautiful conservatory that Mr Josser had ever met. He'd been out in the garden for some time when Mrs Josser and Mrs Marble came out. Mr Josser looked up eagerly. He hoped that Mrs Josser had liked upstairs. But even if she did, Mrs Josser was being guarded. We'll write and let you know, was all she said. When they got as far as the gate, a happy thought came to Mrs Marble. If uh, only we were on the phone, you could uh, phone for a car, she called after them. Uh, but I doubt if it would be any good. You ought to order it the day before, really, if you want to be sure of getting it. They went round by the road because Mrs Marble had left them confused about their route across the fields, and Mrs Josser didn't say very much. How the poor woman manages, I can't imagine, was all she remarked. Nothing but oil to cook with and lost her husband at Easter. It was his idea, the conservatory. They had it built for them. But, yes, but what did you think of the cottage? Mr Josser asked, trying to keep the note of excitement out of his voice. You didn't go upstairs, Mrs Josser told him, or come down again. If you had, you would know what breaking your neck meant. It was after eleven when they got back to number ten, and Mrs Josser was too tired by then to discuss anything further. Her attitude was one which suggested that she could not understand how anyone who had been wafted by destiny into haven like Dulcimer Street could ever think of going to sea again. We're on chapter 79. How are you doing? Elson Chemical Toilet. Oh, we used to have one in my cousin's cottage. Oh, right, an Elson character in Narnia. <laughs> it's like a drum with blue fluid in, with a seat to sit on. The Elson fluid has a distinctive smell. A bit like a portable loo, then, really. I've got one in my van, only I don't use... I don't use Brobat Blue. Do you remember the Kenneth Williams advert? Brobat Blue. No, yeah, he's nice. A little bit of blue. Blue loo. No, <laughs> it's still mucking about. Still mucking about. Anyway, um, oh, yes. Yeah, of course, they laughed, didn't they? Chapter 79. But don't forget that some of the other occupants of number 10 had cut themselves adrift already, and if we wanted to keep them in sight, we shall have to follow. For instance, the doctor's wife at Clemsford is worried about the new housekeeper whom she has just engaged. Wouldn't it have been better, she wonders, if she'd waited and seen if London Registry Offer were going to send someone after all? Not that anyone would have come of it, she consoles herself with that thought. It's really like 1914 all over again. From the very moment war was declared, all the good maids threw up their jobs and rushed off anywhere to make munitions or aeroplanes. And the salaries these workers get... Only that morning the doctor's wife had read about girls of 16 getting five and six pounds a week simply doing piecework, whatever piecework was. It isn't as though there is anything wrong with the new housekeeper. She isn't as strong or as young as she might be, and she is rather slow in consequence. But she is careful, very careful and conscientious. She isn't a smasher. She doesn't drink, and she doesn't seem to want any time off. Nor is it a fact that she is a Roman nor is it the fact that she is a Roman Catholic that upsets the doctor's wife, though naturally she would have preferred the new housekeeper to have been Church of England like the other people. No, it isn't any of those things. It's simply that the doctor's wife is afraid that the new housekeeper is perhaps a bit mad got to be. Who is the new housekeeper? It's got to be Connie, hasn't it? But all the new housekeepers... But the new housekeeper is too tired to notice her employer's suspicion. All that she is concerned is with giving satisfaction. She was lucky to get the job at all in her state of health, and she knows that. And even if the work is heavier than she reckoned on... Working housekeeper was the expression in the advertisement... 
She tells herself that there are other people who are working harder. Above all, it's the money that counts, and 32 and 6 a week and everything found is wonderful. The new housekeeper is sick, secretive and has plans of her own. So long as she can hold the job, she reckons that she'll be able to save £65 a year easily. At the moment, she is standing in front of the window of her bedroom, looking towards the city. She spends a lot of time alone in her room, and sometimes she is heard talking to herself. Oh, it's Mrs Boone, isn't it? It's Mrs Boone. Of course it's Mrs Boone. She's standing in the room of her bedroom, looking towards the city. She spends a lot of time on her own in that room, and sometimes she's heard talking to herself. It's partly this that makes the doctor's wife think that she must be mad. But she isn't. Not a bit of it. The cause of all her troubles is merely that the person to whom she is speaking to, the only person she cares about, isn't there. That is why, morning, afternoon, evening, and sometimes at night as well, she peers out across the garden in the direction of the missing one. Don't worry, Percy boy, she tells him. Mother's here. She's watching. Everything will be all right, Percy. Just try to forget what's happened and remember to say your prayers. Good boy, Percy. That's the main thing. And don't fret about money. There'll be some more ready for you by the time you get it. Mother's near you. She'll see you get everything you need. Then, with that expression of sadness that she's worn for years, the expression that she worn before she had any real reason to wear it, Mrs Boone goes over to the bed and kneels there, her rosary in her hands and the patchwork showing in the heels of her darned stockings. Stockings. Mr and Mrs Josser made two more trips to Conservatory Cottage and after their second visit they went along to Spracket and Clut and paid their deposit to a kind fatherly clerk. There was some little difficulty about this because of the money. Uncle Henry's money. It was all in Mrs Josser's name and she had never written a cheque before. Mr Josser had to stand over her to show her how it should be done and even... So she signed herself Mrs Josser before he could stop her. But there was really more to her hesitation than the mere inexperience. She was suddenly appalled at the enormity of what she was doing. The purchase price was £750, and there she was, solemnly writing away a tenth of it, a whole £70, with a flick of a pen and £75 was something that she could get and £75 was something she could get her mind fixed onto the whole 750 was too large to be imagined she had never really pictured herself actually paying away that amount couldn't you do it fred she asked quite humbly after the second attempt my hands all trembly i've been doing too much and she was still shaky when they came out of the estate agent, still shaky and still appalled. It'll be Ted some day, she said suddenly. That's one comfort. Mr Josser was rather taken back. Don't say that, mother, he told her. We'll have a bit of time f here for ourselves. First. He wasn't disappointed in this sudden change in Mrs Josser's uh, sorry, he was disappointed in this sudden change in Mrs Josser's attitude because right up to that very moment of writing the cheque she'd been so eager and excited about it all. Almost girlish, in fact. She had brushed difficulties and disadvantages aside impetuously. For example, when Mr Josser had said something about it being rather a long way from the station, Mrs Josser had suggested cycling. And when Mr Josser had remarked to her that he couldn't ride a bicycle, she had been offended. I suppose I could learn, couldn't I? She had demanded. Other people my age go about on bicycles, hundreds of them. But now that everything was different, she was timid and unsure of herself. I hope we've done the right thing, she said twice over in the bus, as much to herself as to Mr Josser. I hope we've done the right thing. 
All Mr Joss's assurances, however, counted for very little until she herself thought of Doris. It's Doris I did it as much for as anyone, she said. It's what that girl needs, is plenty of fresh air and sunshine. She isn't really healthy living with Cynthia the way she does. She paused. She'll get used to ride. She'll, she'll just... She'll get used to the ride, she added complacently. There's no harm in a great strapping girl like Dor Doris cycling to the station every morning. And having convinced herself that it was for her children that she had bought the cottage, Mrs Josser felt better. She recovered all her old excitement. On the way up in the train, she kept telling Mr Josser where the various pieces of furniture were to go. It was a rather one-sided conversation, however, because Mr Josser, with a man's natural vagueness on the practical side of things, hadn't thought about the furniture at all. He'd been too busy simply thinking about the cottage. But Mrs Josser was ready to rearrange the furniture for both of them. She gave her whole mind to it, and she gave it so decidedly when and she gave it so decidedly when it came to Doris's room that Mr Josser had to warn her that Doris might want to have some say in that herself. The warning annoyed Mrs Josser. It it seemed to suggest some division division of taste that she refused to admit existed. If I, if I don't know what Doris likes, I'd like to know who does, she answered. I am her mother, aren't I? She paused. Another aspect had crossed her mind. And the first thing in the morning, I'll go down and tell Mrs Vizard, she said. I didn't want to worry her when we were only looking, but she ought to know now. It'll be a shock when she hears. It will be a shock. Oh, my goodness. We're on chapter 80, but we're running out of time. So the first line of chapter 80 until tomorrow is the date for Mr Squales' wedding had been fixed. It was to take place on Wednesday week. But I'm going to leave you t teased by that. Poor old Mr Squales. <laughs> Julia hates it when I say that. Because she thinks he's a terrible character. And I love him. I think he's a funny, funny character. Because he's not real. He's not a real. Anyway, I uh, hope you've enjoyed all of that. Conservatory Cottage. Yes, it all comes flooding back to me now, the end bit. Uh, but there we are. Yes. Uh, location, 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 says Dudley Sawyer. Three times he says it. Uh, Michael White, what's your new channel called Julia? What do you mean her new channel? Um... Chemical Toilet, says uh, it, David Vad. There we go. Uh, which is grand. Um, Lions of South Street. Good grief. What a fantastic name. Oh, what, the um, the estate agents. What does he call it? Clackett and Slut. Or something, not Slut. Clut. Clut. Spracket and Cluts. What does he call it? I've lost it now. Great name. Spracket and Clut. Mr Clut will see you now. Would you like to take your hat off? I'll take your umbrella. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. See you tomorrow. Yes, that's it. Ollie Squales. Ollie Squales? Mm -hmm. Oily Squales. No new channel. Just this one with my name. Just this one with my name. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I must get back to my edit and light the essay and get some uh, food cooked. I've got to record a podcast for the Sunday show this evening. So thank you very much for joining me this last hour. It's been good fun. Keep yourself warm and occupied. And I will see you tomorrow at the same time. Until then, arrivederci. Ta-ta for now. Bye-bye.